not too long ago on this channel, I talked about floating point numbers. We went pretty in depth on how the floating point numbers are actually represented and how we can convert between the binary and the decimal representations right back and forth in both directions. Now, I thought I was pretty thorough in that episode, even though I did say I was, you know, not going to go too deep into every single thing that IEEE actually, you know, sets out for floating point numbers. But as it turns out, I've missed out something pretty glaring. In fact, so much so that uh, my simulations are actually slightly wrong, because there is an H case I didn't account for, such as the life of a program. Let's talk more about this after the break. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So, floating point numbers. As a very quick recap, it consists of a sign, an exponent, and a mantissa. And today is largely focusing on the exponent part of things. Remember that the exponent is a biased exponent. What this means is that instead of storing the actual exponent you want, it is stored with a bias. And this is what helps us get the sign out from the exponent, even though it is technically stored as an unsigned number. Now, that is all well and good. If you know this, you can basically deal with the vast majority of floating point numbers, right? But there is actually one special case that we haven't accounted for. As it turns out, that rule applies for every exponent except one. If your bias exponent is stored as zero, and we use our normal you know, method of calculation, that will give us negative 1 to 7. Except, no, that turns out to not really be the case. You see, if the bias exponent is actually 0, we have to interpret it slightly differently. For one, its actual value is still negative 1 to 6. That means it means the same exponent as when the bias exponent is actually 1. They resolve to the same actual exponent value. But why do that? Well, as it turns out, it does actually affect something else. When your bias exponent is zero, your mantissa is interpreted differently. You see, normally when we work with our mantissa, we assume that it's one point something, right? We always assume that there is a leading one, even though it's not part of the mantissa itself. And the mantissa basically covers the rest of the stuff after the decimal point. However, when your bias exponent goes down to zero, we instead assume that there is a zero in front of the decimal point. These are called subnormal or denormal numbers. You see, usually when we express things as one point something, this is what we call a normalized form. This leads to a problem where when the number gets too small, the normal form doesn't quite capture its value very well. Perhaps there just isn't enough exponents to express that value. And what happens is because of that, the number clips down to zero. And as a result, we lose that number altogether. What we can do is instead of allowing that to happen, we say, well, let's replace that one with a zero. And then all of a sudden, it gives us all the extra zeros in the mantissa to play with. If the number is still so small that the mantissa is entirely zero, then too bad. But if that's not the case, we actually get a graceful degradation of the number rather than just having anything below the exponent just clip to zero instantly. In effect, what this gives us is, well, a few more extra digits for the exponent if you think about it. Of course, the exponent itself doesn't actually change, but every extra zero you have in a mantissa translates to essentially an extra negative exponent, if that makes sense. The reason why I said I essentially got this wrong is because I didn't account for this. Anytime you get zero in the bias exponent, I just treated it as an exponent of negative 127, which is essentially incorrect. I've already fixed the simulator, uh, and what I'm going to do to make things clear is we're just going to walk through a simple example. So let's take a look, right? We'll work through the entire process from start to finish, and then hopefully you can see how well this whole thing works. Let us begin with the simpler of the two operations, which will be to convert a bit string to a floating point number. So we already have everything here split up nicely. And of course, the exponent tells us right away that this will be a denormal number. Starting off with the sign, well, zero means it's positive, no fuss. The exponent itself is all zeros. And this actually tells us two things. First and foremost, that the actual exponent number is negative 126. This one is fixed. 
and of course that the number itself would be the normal. This allows us to move on nicely to the mantisa itself. Of course, how we read off the mantisa is we have to figure out the different powers of 2, right? So the most significant bit here will be 2 to the power of negative 1, and we move on towards the right. So to the power of negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. Of course, we can visually see that there are no other 1s, right? So all there is here is 2 to the power of negative 4. Now, Typically, we would say 1 plus 2 to the power of negative 4, but in this particular case, because we know it is a denormal number, we would not do the 1 plus step. It would just be 2 to the power of negative 4. So, we have sine, exponent, and mentisa, right? We have all our information at hand, and what that means is we're able to derive the answer. So, well, with a positive sign, which we can just completely omit, we write down the mentisa value, which is 2 to the power of negative 4, and then we multiply that by 2 to the power of the exponent. Luckily, this is simple math, right? Giving us the answer of 2 to the power of negative 130. So, this would be what number is represented by this binary string. Of course, I'm not going to write this out as a decimal string, right? I think that number is really too small to make any sense. So I'll just leave it in the exponential form like so. That is our answer. And hopefully this also illustrates to you the power of using the normal numbers, right? We can actually express values with a smaller exponent than, well, the exponent itself can actually support. Of course, like I said, Converting the bits to a floating point number is the easy part. Let's all look at the more complex part of, well, going backwards from the floating point number to its binary representation. Again, I'm going to leave it in its, you know, exponential form because, yeah, decimals are painful. Of course, our first step will be to convert everything to binary. Luckily for us, there is no integer portion, so we'll just do the repeated multiplication required for us to figure out the bit string of the decimal portion. Now, this one is particularly boring because we just keep on multiplying by 2 over and over and over again. We'll keep getting zeros until the very last attempt, where we will get a single 1, the remaining value goes down to 0, and then we can finally stop. There are 130 multiplications in here. This of course gives us a final bit string of 130 zeros followed by a single one in binary. Our next step coming off the back of this is to of course figure out the actual exponent value. Remember how we do this, right? We shift the decimal point towards the right, and every time we do so, our exponent goes down by one. And this time, we've kind of got to keep on doing that again and again until, well, we get to the end. Of course, usually what happens is we're supposed to go until a 1 appears in front of the decimal point. Well, that is if we're dealing with normal numbers, but in this case we are not. What that means is our stopping condition needs to also include the case in which, well, the number is actually the normal. Well, we'll encounter this if we just keep on going right until we reach, well, negative 126. Now, we know there is no negative 127 for the exponent or anything smaller than that, and therefore we have to stop here. The moment you see negative 126 and no 1 before the decimal point, you know for sure that this is going to be a denormal number. So, well, the rest of the steps are fairly similar. Throw away everything you have before the decimal point, and whatever comes after is the mantisa. Really, the only difference between this step and how it usually goes is that the number before the decimal point is now 0, not 1. So we now have all the information we need to put everything together. So let's take a look at that. We now know that our input value, right, essentially goes down to a string like this, which is, well, not in a normal form. First and foremost, well, we look at the sign, well, it's a positive number, that goes to 0, not too difficult. We can then quickly move on to our exponent. Since we know this is a denormal number without doing any more math, we know that the bias exponent needs to be just all zeros. 
Since this is a special case, right, not too difficult, we just look and come to this conclusion. All that's left then is to assemble our mantissa, which as mentioned is everything after the decimal point. This allows us to assemble everything together, our sine of 0, our exponent of all zeros, and our mantissa of 0, 0, 0, 1. Of course, we need to pad this out to a 32-bit number, so we just fill in all the zeros until we get 32 bits. And of course, this would be the exact same value as we put in just now, right? To get our answer to the power of negative 130. So what we've done is we've worked both forwards and backwards, converting between a bit representation as well as the actual floating point number in the special case of d-normal numbers. And there you have it. These are subnormal or d-normal numbers, um, essentially when we throw away the normalization to allow us to have, you know, more zeros in our number. Floating point numbers are really quite complex, and even after this video, we still haven't covered the majority of things in the IEEE definition. You know, things like negative and positive infinity, things like not a number, all of these are, well, considerations to make, right? If you're a CPU manufacturer and you want to implement floating point math, you need to think about all these things to be IEEE compliant. So yeah, something that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, something that we generally take for granted, it's not as simple as it seems. Hopefully this gives you an idea of the depth of this. Anyway, that's all there is for this particular video. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.